Hi, and welcome to Kailash Eco Village. My name is Ole Erson. My wife, Maitri, and I founded Kailash Eco Village in December 2007. And today we're going to do a virtual tour of the premises. Uh, today is the last day of April 2020, and we're in the midst of the coronavirus epidemic. Uh, so we've had requests to uh, do a video of our regular monthly tour. In normal times, the first Saturday of every month at 3 p.m., uh, we do about an hour tour that's open to the public, but that's been temporarily canceled. Uh, hence today's attempt to make an equivalent video. So I'm standing here in our wood chip depot. This is uh, the first stop on our tour. And you'll notice the ground is covered with wood chips. This is a community wood chip depot. We have local arborists uh, from uh, our neighborhood who drop off loads of ground wood, wood chips such as trees and you can also get logs in that way. Um, the wood chip, chips uh, create a foundation for building soil and composting here. Uh, so it's a really important aspect of our gardening projects. Uh, we mix the wood chips with high nitrogen sources uh, to make a balanced nutrient uh, mixture that's ideal for composting. Uh, some of the other things that you can see in this location here are the vertical growing areas. Here we have Marion berries, a type of uh, blackberry. Uh, these are just getting ready to flower now. But you'll notice wherever we have fences, we typically have berries, grapes, uh, raspberries, and other fruit crops um, to, to exploit that particular space. Uh, let me step back a moment and give you some information about Kailash Eco Village. Uh, Kailash Eco Village was an apartment building constructed in 1959. Uh, it consists of 34 units, uh, 31 bedroom units, two two bedroom units, uh, one three bedroom and one four bedroom unit. And we have typically between 50 and 60 residents living here at, at any time. Our focus is primarily on gardening and food production, but we're also interested in rainwater harvesting, uh, renewable energy such as solar energy, uh, composting and recycling. As well as growing uh, berries and grapes on our fences, we try to exploit all of the available space to maximize our uh, food gardening. And one of our most important projects is our fruit tree project. So here you can see some trees planted between the public sidewalk and the street. We have uh, different varieties of apple trees, cherry trees, and plum trees growing here. You may be wondering why I'm standing in the middle of this intersection here. The idea is to illustrate this intersection repair painting that you can see below my feet here. And I'll discuss what that is in just a moment. So this street side bulletin board, as well as the intersection repair painting, are part of our community and neighborhood interface between the Echo Village and the greater community. And here we have a bulletin board with information about Kailash Eco Village for the community and passers-by, as well as a bulletin board for people to post their own uh, messages and items. On the back side of the bulletin board, we've set up an art gallery. It's called the No Stay Art Gallery, uh, particularly great for during the pandemic to share art. I'm standing here before this 1926 bungalow which we remodeled in 2013 as a passive house remodel. Passive house is a German term, uh, which means super insulated and airtight. Uh, and if you incorporate those two design features in residential construction, you can greatly minimize the amount of energy needed to keep um, a good temperature inside the building. 
Uh, in fact, to the point where no fossil fuels are required to condition the house, either by heating in winter or air conditioning in the summertime. Um, one interesting new development is last year we had the first placement of a tiny house in the community here. Here we have a couple living in our tiny house um, and illustrating how you don't need a lot of space to have a really, really nice um, home. So here we are on the west side of the passive house. This building has actually been remodeled as two units. The uh, first floor here is the main unit, uh, but down below us we have what's called an accessory dwelling unit uh, where we have some rooms for rent uh, with several uh, community residents living in their own rooms. Uh, and one particular feature of the accessory dwelling unit is the sunken courtyard, which you can see partially below me. We've terraced that to create gardens for the uh, residents of the house to grow their own flowers and vegetables. I'm standing here in the middle of our circular garden. This is about a 60-foot diameter circle. This large space in front of the building, the front of the main building, used to be a 5,500 square foot parking lot that we depaved in 2009. It actually was set up for 12 cars, uh, but we value gardens over parking, and so we removed the pavement with an organization called Depave and created these lush, veganic gardens. Why did we use a circular configuration? Well, the idea is from the, circle, from the center of the circle right here, we have three sprinklers that can sprinkle the whole area uh, and are easily controlled uh, with these valves here. Uh, if you live in Oregon, you know that summertime irrigation is very, very important. And with just these three sprinklers, we're able to irrigate this approximately six or 7,000 square foot space very, very easily. Uh, you can see it's designed in segments, uh, like slices of a pizza. And uh, around the perimeter, we have grapes, raspberries, fruit trees. This is a fig tree right here. And in the other corner, we have an apricot tree. And on the south side, we have a series of rain swales that run all the length uh, between the parking lot and the gardens, uh, which allow us to percolate into the ground all of the water that lands on the site. I'm standing here below our kiwi trellis. You can see above me, these are, this is made with heavy duty, these heavy duty sturdy posts. And you can see we have some, uh, core, some panels above us that the kiwis rest on. If you look closely, you can see the kiwis are about ready to flower. Uh, this will probably be our first year of kiwi fruits. Uh, to my right here, you can see the bulletin board in the background and the intersection, the painted intersection in the rear behind me. And to my left here, this is the lowest point on the property. This is our lowest swale, which catches the water from the roof and the driveway uh, and allows it to percolate into the ground. I'm standing here in front of our reflecting pond. This reflecting pond has a very interesting story. This is actually the oldest structure on the property. It was part of a house that used to be here before the parking lot uh, was developed as part of the um, main building behind me. Uh, and we recently repaired this and turned it into, uh, or restored it as a reflecting pond. But right behind me, 
is our water well. We drilled that well uh, shortly after we started the project here to provide irrigation water for the gardens. Uh, as you can imagine, with almost two acres of gardens here, we use a phenomenal amount of water to irrigate during the summer growing season, and this has made it economically feasible to do that. Uh, one thing that you might notice on top of the pump house is a living roof uh, with colonized with succulents and flowers. I'm standing here by one of our rain channels. Uh, this building has about an 11,000 square foot roof behind me. Uh, and the water is divided into the south half of the building, which comes down this channel here. Uh, and the north half comes on the other side, which we'll see in a moment through a, and is channeled through a rainwater sculpture. So whenever it rains, uh, this channel here becomes a running stream. And another feature that you can see here is the roof of our pump house. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a living roof covered with succulents and flowers. As I mentioned, the uh, building stormwater drainage uh, consists of two drain, two drainages, the north side and the south side of the building. The north side of the building is channeled through this rainwater sculpture that you see around me and activates these water wheels whenever the rain begins. And the roof area is so large that even with a small rain event, uh, the water wheels start spinning immediately. They get the first water from the, this side's drainage. If there's adequate water, then it's channeled to the higher water wheels and the rain chains above me. And behind me, you can see this is our community courtyard here, and this is our community room. We have a community kitchen uh, and gathering space for potlucks and various social events behind me. So here's our community kitchen. Uh, this is a great space for potlucks here and other community events. Uh, you saw earlier in the shot the com our community video station so we can do um, movie nights and things like that as well as presentations. Um, but we have a lot of nonprofit groups using this space too such as Food Not Bombs, Northwest Veg, and other community organizations. So here you can see our community tea house with its living roof. This was built by one of our dear residents many years ago. Uh, he used to live in this unit here, and this was his little social space for his guests. You can see all along here, these gardens here are tended by the residents who live next to the spaces along this north side of the building. We do a tremendous amount of composting here. This is our kitchen compost courtyard here. In addition, we have a humanure compost courtyard. But all the residents are required to compost all their kitchen scraps as well as their garden refuse. This is a bin of garden, uh, garden refuse right here. You can see we have 11 bins arranged in the configuration of a courtyard. Each bin is about two and a half cubic yards, and it takes us about nine months to do a complete circle around and fill all the bins. Um, every two weeks, we have a work party uh, where residents get together. Usually we have about 10 residents uh, come and over the course of half hour to an hour, we empty the buckets. You can see here, these are buckets of uh, 
kitchen compost ready to be composted. Our technique is to use a lasagna layering method. So uh, we'll put down a layer of garden refuse first and then cover with four or five buckets of kitchen compost and then alternate a layer, another layer of garden refuse until all the materials are used up. Once a bin is full, we move on to the next bin. Uh, and you can see each bin is labeled uh, with when it was filled. So we have pretty good records uh, about how, uh, how our compost production is actually working out. This is our bike shed, bike parking shed here for covered bike parking. In addition, we store all our garden tools here and we have an emergency firewood storage uh, as part of our emergency preparation, emergency preparedness program. You'll see a loop of black pipe on the roof. That actually is an inexpensive solar collector uh, for our solar shower, which is actually located right here. Welcome to our solar powered shower here. Uh, you can see uh, we have a little shower here located in our bike shed, which allows us to take showers during the sunny hours and get free solar heat. And one thing I want to mention is it's very important to use potassium-based soaps. We only use potassium-based soaps for uh, the shower because the, the system here, the shower, as well as the sink to my left here, drain into a gray water area and it's important to avoid sodium-based soaps. So below the garden tools here is where our gray water from our sink and shower uh, come out of our bike shed building. And you can see we have two zones for gray water disposal. This zone here, which is controlled by the switch here, this zone here uh, irrigates this bed of artichokes to my left side and this side here goes in that direction and we'll show you what it looks like. It's a kale bed that we usually grow kale crops uh, and it has the advantage that you can see all of the plumbing hardware to show how the gray water is split into different areas. So this is the second zone for our gray water disposal. And you can see uh, each of these, uh, inside each of these is a water splitter. So the gray water that comes from the shower when it's diverted in this direction comes to this point and then it's split into these two and those two beds. And this is a second splitter here so the water that comes from there comes to here and then is split into these two beds and then finally the water percolates into the ground at these two areas. And the same occurs uh, behind me here in these two areas. I'm standing here in the middle of our individual plot gardens. Uh, you can see one of the plots right in front of me here. These are about 10 by 10 uh, feet or about 100 square feet for each plot. And each of these plots is assigned to one or more residents. Uh, our program is modeled after the Portland Community Gardens uh, program uh, where individuals are uh, allowed to garden city property. Uh, in this case here, the individual decides what they want to plant. They can put trellises, such as this bamboo trellis, uh, or art objects. Sometimes you'll see sculptures and other things. Um, one thing that this reminds me of is we have an extensive uh, microforestry project here where we grow a lot of bamboo. And this is an example of bamboo we've grown on site to use as trellises and stakes.
So let me take a moment to discuss our group gardens program. Besides our individual garden program, which takes up about 25% of the garden space, the group gardens program is managed by a group of about 25 families uh, that communally garden large spaces. For example, the, the garlic patch that you can see in front of me or the tomatoes that you can see here. These have just been put in their greenhouse cages. Uh, also part of the group gardens program is our greenhouse. And you can see we do a lot of starts here. Uh, these are cilantro and different uh, brassica family. Um, the other 50% of the gardens are ornamental and fruit gardens. So our uh, garden mix is 25% individual plots, 25% communally grown annual crops, and 50% of perennial berries, grapes, uh, and fruit trees. Welcome to the urination station. This little building here, constructed like an, out, like an outhouse, has a men's urinal mounted to the side here and a regular composting toilet here where people can either go number one or number two. Uh, and we have an on-site composting um, processor that processes all of the material that comes out of the toilet. Okay, I'm standing right here in front of the urination station here, and this tank here is one of our urine collection tanks. If you look closely, you can see a pipe coming out of the building here. This is from the men's urinal inside, and the urine is diverted into this 55-gallon drum. Uh, you can see if you look at the side, this tank is about half to two-thirds full of urine. Um, and you'll also notice these several much larger tanks. These tanks are 275 gallons each. We have five of them, and these are used to store urine that is collected by residents in bottles or buckets in resident units, and then brought here uh, to drop off. If you look at the last tank there, you'll see there's a funnel. That's where uh, residents pour their pee into that tank. That is our current collecting tank. Uh, the urine is allowed to sit for six months. Uh, that allows the pH to rise to a quite alkaline degree, and that kills any potential pathogens in the pee. At that point, the urine can be distributed to the landscape um, as part of our nutrient reclamation program. So here I am at the lumber rack. Uh, you can see when we have scrap wood from construction projects, we leave the remnants here for any resident to use for their craft projects, including we do a lot of uh, bamboo work here for trellises and stakes. Here's a whole shelf full of bamboo. We've grown all of this on site. And behind me, you'll see our pipe rack. We also have a supply of masonry. Uh, blocks, concrete blocks, and uh, tile, stained glass, uh, fence posts, and pipes for use in different projects. Welcome to our humanure composting courtyard. Uh, you can see Behind me and on both sides of me, we have a uh, courtyard constructed of dry stack concrete blocks, similar to our kitchen compost courtyard. That, that was the model for this. The important differences are for when you're composting uh, excrement, human excrement, uh, you want to cover the bins and each bin is lined with concrete. So here's a bin. The bins are exactly the same size as the uh, kitchen compost courtyard. We fill the bins to the full height, and as they process over a period of a year, the compost shrinks down to about half the size, and then it's ready for harvesting. 
So here's an example of the material we produce in this courtyard. Uh, one year ago, approximately, this was a mixture of toilet paper, excrement, and wood chips. And over the course of uh, a year, it was heated to a high temperature to sanitize the compost and uh, process it so that it's impossible to identify the original ingredients. And at this point, the finished compost has a very pleasant fragrance, very earthy, and we use this on ornamental plants, fruit trees and fruit bearing plants, such as berries, squashes and other plants. As most gardeners know, pollination is a really important part of uh, gardening and we have five or so beehives here. Uh, we have three different styles of beehives. This one here is a top bar hive. To my left here is a waré hive. And in front of me here is the Langsdorf hive. That's the more uh, widely used in commercial circles. And behind me you can see our rooftop cupola. Great, so I, I'm now at, on our cupola balcony on the south side where you can see we have solar panels behind us. Our goal is actually to eventually produce all of the power on site that is used in the building and we plan to do that within the next year or so. So this is one of our most important community spaces on the property. This is our food share table here. Residents drop off extra produce, uh, extra foodstuffs like this uh, package of crackers that somebody didn't need, wanted to share with other persons. Uh, we also have this beautiful mosaic uh, to my left here. And on the other side of the breezeway is our community bulletin board uh, with notices and guidelines and things like that. I'm standing here in our orchard area. We have about 50 fruit trees that we planted since we started the project. Uh, here's one that we planted a couple of years ago. We had to replace some peach trees that were not doing well. That's why this tree is smaller. But most of the trees are larger that you can see in the, uh, to my side. And the other thing I wanted to point out here is our bamboo hedge. On the north half of the property, the north east and west edges. Uh, we have a bamboo hedge that goes next to the fence. It provides some screening as well as uh, providing a, an abundant harvest of different uh, diameter bamboo poles. So this is another one of our cherished community gathering points here. Uh, besides people hanging out, uh, lazing in the hammocks, we have a fire circle in front of us. Uh, it's a great place for ceremonial events like celebrating the solstices or the equinoxes. Um, we'll have fires from all of the wood that we produce on site. Right. Here you can see our uh, timber bamboo grove and I passed by some of the thinner species. Uh, we use these for a lot of different uh, bamboo projects. One of our residents actually uh, created a didgeridoo with this heavier duty thick bamboo. Uh, oftentimes we'll have meditations in this space next to the bamboo. So here's our uh, water storage tank. This is designed for emergency preparedness. This is a 1500 gallon cistern filled with either rainwater or in uh, the current case, well water. 
uh, when the big earthquake hits from the Cascadia subduction zone, we anticipate possibly being cut off from the uh, water and sewer grid for potentially an extended period of time. Uh, this provides enough water for uh, each resident to have one gallon per day for 30 days. And we can refill this from our on-site well using solar power if we need to. Among our residents here, we have a plethora of super talented gardeners. Here's an example of an individual garden plot uh, that's done in a particularly artistic fashion. You can see a great selection of herbs, flowers, and vegetables, as well as sculpture elements like the trellises and the rocks. So uh, I'm standing in our pool areas, gardens. Uh, this is a, as well as a gathering spot, it's surrounded by gardens all the way around. Here, for example, is uh, one of our herb gardens. And these are the blueberry gardens behind. We have strawberry gardens there. And right next to the, and in front of the resident units, we have three individual garden plots. Uh, behind me, a little bit closer to the edge of the property, you can get a little bit of a view of our squash tunnel. So I'm standing now in, our, in the middle of our squash tunnel. Uh, this is made of animal panels that are purchased at a supply store, a farm supply store. They're about 16 feet long and about three and a half feet wide. And the panels are bent in an arch shape, uh, fixed at each side. And then in the summertime, we plant squashes on both sides. The squash vines grow all the way over the trellis, and the squash fruits hang down like Christmas ornaments under the arch. Uh, of course, in the wintertime, when we're not growing squash, it makes a great clothesline. So I'm seated here in the middle of our second deep pave project, which we call the parking lot garden. Uh, several years back, uh, the residents who live next to me here wanted to remove some of the pavement and create this um, buffer space between the parking lot and their units. And they tend this little garden here, as do residents on the north side of the building. So we took out about three and a half parking spaces to make this garden. Uh, and it's also the start of our south side rainwater garden. Uh, the water from the south side roof comes down in this pipe in front of me here and then enters the stream beds that you saw in an earlier scene. So thank you for joining us on this lovely spring late afternoon for our virtual tour of Kailash Eco Village. Uh, we hope that you'll be able to return once the pandemic ends and take an actual tour. Again, our tours are in the summertime, monthly on the first Saturday of the month. Please join us. Thank you.